So today, we are going to start on a brand new series called The Clock is Ticking. Uh, and this is no reference to the trade war between China and uh, US when they banned the TikTok, TikTok. Okay, has no reference to that. Uh, but they say the clock is ticking to tell us that we are nearer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ than we were before. So what's the title of my message this morning is this, Make the Second Coming Your First Priority. Right? Make, your sec- make the Second Coming Your First Priority. I'm going to give you a couple of verses. And uh, today I want to establish the biblical truth of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the second coming is more than just a teaching of the church, but rather this is what God has stated in His Word, and therefore we have faith and we look forward to the coming of Jesus. So it's going to be partially preaching and teaching because I'm going to go through numerous verses together with you, and we're going to see directly from the Word of God. We're going to start on with Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. The book of Revelation is the last book. And in the very first chapter, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and what, who is to come, the Almighty. So the one who was okay, in past, who is today, and, but he also says that he is the one who is to come. Down in Revelation 3, 11, Jesus tells this to the church, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. And if you come to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus prophesies and promises us on three occasions that he will come back very soon. Therefore, these are three prophecies by Jesus in the last chapter in the book of Revelation. So these are the verses in Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. Then going down in verse 12, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So, for this prophecy, for the first one, it says, I'm coming soon. Keep, make sure that you keep the the commandments. Then the second one is that I'm coming soon. Make no, and I'll give to everyone. I'll reward those who follow my ways. And for the very last verse in Revelation 22, he who testifies to these things says, I am come, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Why don't you say this verse aloud? Everyone, ready? One, two, go. So when Jesus says, I am coming soon, this is when the believers respond, Amen, come, Lord Jesus which the early church would use the word called Maranatha. Okay, when it says, when God says, I am coming soon, we should respond, Amen, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Now, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is very closely parallel to the uh, wedding stages of a Jewish, um, in the Jewish culture. So what they do in a wedding in a Jewish culture, you know, um, tells us of how Jesus is going to come. He as the bridegroom coming for the church as the bride. Now, there are four stages. The first stage is the betrothal. The betrothal, now, in other words, there's, uh, we we would call it the engagement. Uh, You would um, make an agreement that, you know, you're for one another and you're going to plan later down, you know, a date for the wedding day. Obviously, nowadays, engagement are not very popular. How many of you all were engaged before you got married? Can you just show me a wave? All of you are straight already got married, right? Yeah. Um, For myself and Pastor Sheila, we went through an engagement uh, before our marriage because at that time, you know, I was still in Bible school, and in Bible school, they do not allow you to get married while you are studying in Bible school. Now, those were the 
old days. Uh, nowadays, it's, uh, it's, it's different. So there was an engagement. And then after I completed my Bible school, right, uh, and, uh, in February itself, we, we got married. So there was the betrothal. Betrothal is when you, when you agree and make a commitment that you are the person I'm getting married. And it's as serious as the wedding itself. You don't change mind after that. Then the second thing is that there is a preparation. The preparation whereby the bridegroom will go back to his own hometown and prepare the place, you know, for their life together. Right? So he goes back and he prepares either in his father's house or he may build another, you know, uh, another house so that he can bring the wife there. Then the third stage is that he would go back to where the, the wife is and with an entourage, move into the village and you know, uh, meet with the wife and bring the wife there. And lastly, when they reach back to the uh, groom's village, they will have the wedding ceremony and the celebration. Each of these steps tells us of how you know, Jesus relates to us as he as our bridegroom coming for the church, the bride. The betrothal took place when the crucifixion, whereby he made a commitment, I am for you and I've chosen you. Right? And he, the commitment is so strong that he died for us. And then he goes back to heaven. And what does he say in John 14? He says, I am going back and I will prepare a place for you. Then he says, you will come back for us. I will come back and bring you to be with me. And that's where we understand the word called the rapture. And lastly, when we are with Christ, there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now let's take a look in John chapter 14, verse 1 to 4. This is where I uh, quoted to you just now. In John 14, verse 1 to 4 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Because in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am and you know the place to the place where I am going. So he tells them, first of all, do not let your hearts be troubled. As we look around us now, right, with the pandemic still raging in certain major countries, uh, we see that we do not know when this will stop. And when the things that are going unplanned for and every, everything, you know, is a new challenge on a daily basis, we need to hear what God has to say to us that He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, obviously, there is a certain level of anxiety, a certain level of concern, what's going to happen, right? Um, how would tomorrow be? How would the shape of business be? What's going to happen to education? And, and there are many concerns that we have. But God will tell us, He says, that, do not let your hearts be troubled. Everything is still under God's control. He still is sovereign. Therefore, he tells us to trust in him. Trust in God as you trust in me, says Jesus. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. When Jesus says things, he does not just play with words. He does not just want to make you feel good. He does not want to make you an empty promise. What he says is the truth. He says, trust in me. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And what, what is he telling us? I'm going there to prepare a place for you. In God's eyes, in God's truth, in God's no, doctrine to us, this world is temporal. And we were seeing how temporal things are. And it can change any moment. But he is going to, there, to heaven to prepare a place for us. He says, I will come back. A strong, clear promise to you and I. I will come back. Now you remember the Terminator, 
you know, series of movies when Arnold would say, I'll be back. And you can expect there's a sequel to that, to that uh, movie. And here Jesus says, that, I'll be back. I will come back for you. Now, how is it all going to unfold for you and I? And we're going to look in the, the passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18 very closely. And we're going to move step by step and uh, see what, how is it going to come back for you and I. Now, the backdrop of Thessalonians is this. The, the belief of the second coming is so strong, so minim, imminent, that the believers then expected Christ to come in their lifetime. And so as they would continue lives, some of them died in the process, some of them have, you know, uh, through age, some of them through persecution, and there was a, you know, unsettling inside the heart. It says, we are waiting for Christ to come, and now some of our family members, some of our believers have died. What's going to happen to them? Right? And uh, are they going to miss out on the coming of Jesus? And so Paul begins to write this letter to the Thessalonian Christians and begin to explain to them very, very you know, clearly what's going to happen. So found in chapter 4, verse 13 to 18, it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. Ignorance means those who do not have the knowledge of what is really going to happen. God does not want us to be ignorant, but to know the truth. Now, those who fall asleep are those that means who have died. That's the terminology when you know, the New Testament uh, refers to death. It is a falling asleep. That means it is going to be temporal. The person is going to wake up, but it's going to be waking up in a different realm with a different uh, resurrected body. But it says it's just falling asleep. And then the next phrase, that's the next slide, just move on to the next slide, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. God doesn't want us to grieve like normal people who have no hope. Because we do have a hope. Paul says, though a person dies in this life, we have a hope that is beyond this life. And therefore, though we shed tears, though we feel a deep loss of someone who is, you know, who is a family member, someone who we have grown up with and we respect, and a person is no longer there, we do feel you know, sad and sorrowful. But yet, our hearts have hope. And we do not grieve like those who do not have hope. So what is this hope? In fact, it is described to us that this hope is called the blessed hope. Not just only the resurrection, but it is the hope that Christ is coming back and to bring us to be with Him. Now, as scary as the coronavirus is, we know that even those who are believers who have succumbed to this virus, they have right now gone to be with the Lord. And their hope is secure. It is not the end of their lives or the end, you know, and that there's a, there is a continuation of their life after this earth. So the next verse, it tells us this, why do we have this confidence that He's coming back? And you can see clearly how Scripture ties on to one another. Here's what Paul writes. We believe that Jesus died and rose again so that we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. The death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus is tied in with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, his whole life is very coherent. Jesus was born through a sinless birth. He was born through a virgin. And he lived his life sinless. And therefore, when he died, he could die for all humanity. If Jesus' birth was through a normal birth, he would have been born with sin. But he was born without sin. And therefore, when he died, his blood can cleanse all the sins of the whole of humanity. When after he died, he conquered death, he resurrected. 
which is a promise given to you and I that we will also rise up from the grave. And because He resurrected and is alive forevermore, and He has gone back to heaven, therefore, this living Jesus will come back for us. Because if Jesus never resurrected from the dead, how can He come back if He has not conquered death, if it is still locked, you know, in the grave? But because He's resurrected, He is living, He can come back. So doctrine upon doctrine is built upon one another. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with Him, in Him. So it's always Jesus coming back for His believers. Therefore, in the last word, in the last part, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, we who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, who was the who was who were the ones who were worried about those who have passed away? It was those who are living. Okay, those who are living, they're worried. What happens to grandma who has passed away? You know and uh, Jesus did not come yet. Well, who, what, what has happened to uncle who has passed away? So they were concerned about their dead uh, family members, or uh, dead brothers and sisters. But Paul says, assured, hey, you don't have to worry. When Jesus Christ comes, in fact, they are the ones that will go before you. Right? They will not be, not be missed out. They will be in the top list of people who will rise up to, first of all, meet the Lord in the air. And that's the hope that you and I have for all our loved ones who have gone ahead of us, right, and who have passed on from this life. We know that when Christ comes, they are the ones that will be resurrected up and meet Him in the air. Now we go on to the following verses. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven. Where will He come down? He will come down from heaven. It tells us He will not come from the Philippines. You know why I say Philippines? Because there's one guy there who claims himself to be Jesus Christ incarnate. And he has got a huge following. He's not going to come from the Philippines. Do you know there's another false Christ who comes from South Korea? Uh, he's not going to come from South Korea. In fact, there is another one so-called claimed to be Jesus Christ who comes from Japan. And uh, there is another individual that, uh, who claims to be Christ who, who comes from the land in Iceland. He does, he's not going to come from these places. He has gone back to the Father in heaven. And where will he come from? He will come from heaven to earth. When Jesus ascended up to God. He was lifted out in a crowd. The disciples' head were, you know, looking up in the sky. And the angel says, why are you looking up in the sky? Do you not know that this same Jesus who ascended right before your eyes is going to come back down in a cloud? They were at the Mount of Olives. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he says that this same Jesus not a Philippine Jesus, not a Korean Jesus, not an Iceland Jesus, not a Jesus, no, someone who claims in Brazil, but it says this same Jesus who was hung on the cross, who you recognize face to face, who will still have the nail pierced, no, hands, and on his hand and his feet, this same Jesus will come back. And it's not going to come back in spirit form. Some people feel that Jesus has already come back. But he's in spirit form. He's come back already. You don't have to wait for his second coming. But very specifically, Acts chapter 1 tells us what? This same Jesus, not coming back in spirit form, but in his resurrected body. So and how will he come back? With a loud shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. When Christ first came, it was a very quiet affair. The whole of Bethlehem weren't awoken at night. Right? He was born in a stable and placed in a manger. That's where he was born. 
among animals and only with the father and mother that are there. Well, later on, there are some shepherds that came. Later on, the three wise men came. But that's about it. It was a very quiet affair. But when he comes back again, what it says, he comes with a loud command. The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God will sound. This loud command, even the dead will hear it. Because why? That's the signal for them to rise up from the grave. It is so strong, so powerful, that it says, the dead in Christ will rise first. So when the dead, do you know the only thing that the dead will hear when the trumpet sounds from God? He says, wake up time. Huh? All other alarms, you cannot wake them up. But when Christ comes, they will wake up and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this dead in Christ, realize it is not every dead. Not everyone is going to meet Christ in the air, but it's those who are dead in Christ. So the teaching of Scripture is that this resurrection does not even refer to the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints will be resurrected later. But here, the first resurrection, first phase of the resurrection are those who are dead in Christ. They will rise first. And then, it says, after death, we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So those who are still alive, they will rise and be caught up. The word caught up here means to be snatched away, right? To be caught up. Now, the Greek word for this word, caught up, is a word called hapazo. That's the Greek word that is written caught up. But when they translate it into the Latin, where they have the Latin Vulgate, they use a Latin word called rapia, which then we have our English word rapture. Caught up and there is will be their rapture, the saints will be caught up in the air. So literally, the, the English word rapture does not appear in our, in our Bible. That word that appears there is called hapazo. Do you know that the word trinity is also not in the Bible? Right, but the concept of Trinity is all over the, you know, the, the, the pages of the Scripture. Do you know, in fact, the word Bible is not in the Bible? You, you, read, you read your Bible, there's no word that says Bible, except that when you print the cover of the Bible, it says Holy Bible. But you read the Holy Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, there is no word called Bible. But it doesn't mean that it is not existent, right, or it, it's not important. So, the word rapture has its meaning there coming from hapazo. And that is this, we who are still alive will be caught up. That's why we have a teaching called the rapture. The meeting of the living believers being caught up together and where to meet the Lord, where? On the earth? No, it is very clear. It says we'll meet the Lord in the air. We'll meet the Lord in the air. And therefore, Paul writes, and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So the next question that we need to ask ourselves about the second coming, that it has been established in Scripture that He will come back again. So we need to ask ourselves, when will He come? I've been praying a lot and asking God to show me when He will come back. And today I'm glad to you, to, to, to you that I'm going to declare a secret word that God has given to me to tell you when He will come back. And the word that is there, when He will come back, is this, I don't know. I don't know when He will come back, but He will come back surely. Because it's written in the scripture. If you're trying to say, you know, which year is coming back, which month, which date, which, 
unfortunately, in, you know, in days uh, before, there were those who were uh, trying to predict when Christ is coming back. In fact, there is this man called Pastor Miller. Uh, in the year of April, he predicted that Jesus Christ would come on April the 3rd, 1843. And 3,500 followers jammed into the Boston Advent Temple. Right? From midnight to midnight of the um, April 2nd to then, you know, the 12 o'clock at night on April the 3rd, no sign of Jesus coming. So everybody went back home very disappointed. You think, you know, all the con congregation would be gone and this pastor's ministry is over. But surprisingly, he said, oh, I made a wrong calculation. He's coming back at a different date, and he gave a new date, April 18, 1844. So he said, I've recalculated that, and uh, some of his believers believed that, and that day came and went. Jesus Christ didn't come back. You thought that his ministry would be totally finished, over. But then he made a third prediction. He says, no, 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 I, I, I'm very sorry, I, I made a, Now I've really seen things you know, clearly. Yeah, and he uh, says he's going to come back on October 22nd, 1844. And he rallied, he preached to his uh, believers. And there was so much enthusiasm that has not been seen before. Churches who did not accept his prediction, he called them as heretics. He called them as agents of the devil. And uh, in fact, there were some other pastors who were deceived by this guy called Pastor Miller. And his congregation so now left the fields unharvested. They left their shops closed. People quit their jobs. Some people quickly, you know, gave away their, their furniture, gave away their belongings because we don't need it anymore. We won't be here on earth. And uh, even the press began to print the headlines. He says, prepare to meet your God. What day is today right now? What day is today right now? August? August the 9th? 2020, and you know that Jesus Christ did not come, right? But there are individuals who would try to predict and tell you that they know exactly when Christ is going to come. Don't believe them. Because in Matthew 24, verse 36 to 41 says, No one knows that that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That was at a time when Jesus spoke these words. But obviously now that Jesus is, you know, with the Father, he would know what time he's coming back. But at the time when he made a statement, he says, not even me. Jesus says, would know when is the time of my coming. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, it says, Now, brothers, about the times and days, we do not need to write to you to know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. At a time, now the thief in the night gives us an idea that it's going to come a time whereby you won't expect him. The thief, do you, do you know the thief never sends you an SMS or WhatsApp says, tonight we are coming? <laughs> they won't tell you. Uh, they, will, they will come at a time whereby you are least unsuspecting. Or they will watch you know that you are going on a holiday, your, your vehicles are uh, all there and uh, there are there's some newspapers lying in front of the, of the gate, you know, two, three days, no one has picked it up. Or, you know, the, uh, what is that, the rubbish bin, the guys who have collected the rubbish, put it in front there and two, three days it's left there, they know that the house is empty and therefore they will strike at that time. So it that gives us an idea that we will not be prepared unless we are very watchful. But it gives us one thing the scripture tells us is this. It says when Jesus Christ comes, it will be, though we do not know the time and date, 
and year, but it will be like the days of Noah. Can we have that verse? I think it's the next one. Yeah. It says, as, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. There was no indication that there was a flood. Though Noah has been preaching for 600 years, either verbally or, you know, in demonstration when he was building the ark and everybody was curious, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? I'm building the ark, flood is coming, but nobody paid any attention to Noah. He preached for 600 years, nobody got saved, but he kept on working on the ark. And they were going about business as usual. But you will also know that that's how it is. The world will be going through a time whereby they will regard everything as normal. And they couldn't care less about the coming of the Lord Jesus. But the days of Noah are also days that are marked with a lot of decadence in morality. Because God was going to destroy the earth. Why? It tells us in Genesis 6, 5 and 11 and 12, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of, the, of his heart was only evil all the time. In verse 11 and 12, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, full of violence, and God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. This I believe that we can identify. Aren't we not living in a very decadent world right now? A world that abortions are legalized. A world that there is no shame in people going to alternative relationships. That in this age and time and with such progress in intellectual abilities and civilization, men are still so wicked that they are involved in sex trafficking of women and children. There's corruption in every level, substance abuse, disloyalty, betrayals, injustices, blatant sins. We are actually living in a, a generation right now, I call it the, the shameless generation. People can be involved in dark sins in days before that people do it covertly, you know, do not want to be seen by the public, the one on their own, right now they step out of those shadows and they're not ashamed of the things that they are doing. We live in a shameless, gen we are a shameless generation. It tells us this, that our conscience are hardened. There's a hardening of the conscience to the will and, you know, to the laws of God. There are some laws of a toddler. Some may say that this is an evidence of original sin. If you look at small little children, this is what children would say. If I like it, it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I've had it a little while ago, it is mine. If it's mine, it will never be yours in any way. If I'm doing and building something, all the pieces are mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you're playing with something and you put it down, it automatically becomes mine. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> Someone posted this on his Facebook. He says that this happened to him this morning. He was waiting in line to pay you know, at a grocery, and it was taking out 50 dollars, ringgit, and his 50 ringgit fell off, right, and uh, it landed near to the person who were at the cashier. So the person saw the money, picked it up, and you know, this man who was waiting behind it stretched out his hand and says that, he says that this is mine, I dropped it. The one who took it looked at him as if he did not exist, and say, whatever is in the, on the floor and whoever picks up, it, it is theirs. 
So he, he, was, he was shocked by his response. And so the man took the money and uh, walked out to the car park. And so he ran after the man and says, that that's my money, give me back, I have to pay for my groceries, I forgot to bring up my car, that, that money belongs to me. And he said some people nearby who was waiting at the counter, you know, ran outside and see what would happen. But the man refused to give back the money. So the man reached the car, and he says that he reached up for his you know, uh, car key, he put the groceries down, there were four bags of them, and uh, he reached out for his car key to open the car door. So this person who lost that $50, you know, had his heart throbbing with excitement. He says that this is my only chance. He put down the grocery, four bags. He grabbed the four bags. And he says, whatever is on the floor, it's now mine. And he ran away with it. <laughs> and uh, he says, you know, inside there, there were large prawns, right? There was salmon, uh, and, uh, and when I read towards the end, I thought, wow, this, no. It was towards the end, it says that this is just a story for you to read so that to encourage you to do more reading. <laughs> but it was an interesting story. But we're living in an age that by, it can be as real as could have been described. There are people who possibly would want to commit something like that. I went to buy bread this morning, and uh, as I went to the store, and normally, you know, the wholemeal bread of Gardenia cost three thirty, so I had five dollars, and I didn't want to keep any. I had some coins, so I took up some coins and I gave it to the cashier. It was a Malay cashier, a lady cashier. I gave it to her. So I, I gave that, and uh, I took the bread and I walked out already. And she called me uncle. I got to get used to that. You know? When I go now to buy food, people call me uncle. <laughs> what do you want, uncle? <laughs> so she says, uncle, come, come, your change. And so she was so kind, no, she would give me back the $2 change. Right? And I, and I said thank you to her. I mean, obviously, there are some still honest, good people that are around. I, I've walked out already. I've already stepped out of the shop. She called me back. So, but it says that we are living in a world that is decadent in many ways in morality. When, when Christ comes, what is he going to do? What's the reason of him coming back? The reason he has come back is this. He has come back to bring us to be with him, but he's coming back primarily as a judge. A judge for Christians, a judge to unbelievers. For Christians, we will appear before the Bema judgment seat of Christ. Do you know that Christians will be judged according to our works? It's true. We will not be judged for our sin. Christ has paid the price at Calvary. But we'll be judged for our works. And therefore, it is not just, you know, a casual statement when, when we often tell someone, oh, you're working in a church, you're working as a volunteer, you're, you're giving so much sacrifices, know this, that you're reward in heaven, and sometimes we just laugh it off. But that's the truth. Where do we get the idea? It is from Scripture. It's from Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. We will appear before. But it is for judgment, for rewards. So what are we investing in? I know that, you know... Um, interest rate has dropped down to an all-time low. And I don't know, my, my, no, the relationship manager says, likely there will be another cut before the end of the year. Uh, so the interest rates are going to be very, very low. Okay? But it says, where are you investing in? It says, if you invest in the kingdom of God, we will get our rewards. But there is another judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. 
This great white throne judgment is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 12. I'm not too sure whether I have that verse up there or not. You try the next slide. Okay. I'll read it for you. Then I saw the great white throne judgment and him who seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. That means that if they found their names are not in the book of life, they will be judged to burning hell. That's the white throne, the great white throne judgment. Warren Wiersbe writes this story in his book called Meet Yourself in the Psalms. He recounted during the early cowboy days of the frontier land of America, there was this runaway wagon which had a small kid there. You know, and the, car, the horses were running wild and this small kid has no way to save himself. If he crashed, this little boy would die. So it was a stranger who saw the incident, rode as fast as he can, and somehow was able, at the risk of his own life, brought the, uh, the wagon under control and saved this young, innocent boy. This boy, however, grew up to become a very lawless man. At one time, and he grew up, at one time he was caught for murder. And then in the trial, he was brought before the judge. And when the, when the trial was going on, this lawless man looked at the judge and he saw a familiar face. He said that this face looks very familiar. And he recounted back and he realized that it was that stranger who saved him when he was in the runaway wagon. So just before the judge gave the verdict, the defendant came and said, Judge, do you remember me? He says, I'm the boy that, saved, that you saved. Then the, then the judge recognized him and remembered the boy. And this is what the judge said to the young man. Young man, when you were a small child, I was your saviour. Today, I am your judge. And I must sentence you to be hanged. You see, for the first coming of Jesus, He came as the saviour. He came to save us, to rescue us. He gave up even His life to die for us. But if we were to walk lawlessly, you know, in our own ways, when Christ comes back, He will come back not as the Lamb of God, He will come back as the Lion of Judah, and He will come as a judge that we will have to pay for our own sins. And therefore, let me in closing give you what our response should be when it comes to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. This should be our response in Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Keep watch. Be watchful. Don't be spiritually asleep, or don't be spiritually slumber. But keep watch. And then in Matthew 24, verse 44, it says, Oh, also be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect Him. He will come any time. So you must be what? Ready. So what are the three things I want to tell you in our response? How do we get ready for the coming of Christ? Most of you have come here by a vehicle, and if you drive a car, you would definitely have, you should have a spare tire in your car, if you do not know it yet. <laughs> Some of you never know that there is a spare tire. Which oftentimes what we do is this, we would get you know, our, all the tires inflated properly, but we, if you are like me, we would seldom inflate the spare tire. Right, because there's some stuff to take up, you know, and to get to the spare tire. 
But you know, nobody can predict when your tire can be punctured or when it will blow. And when it blows, and if your spare tire is deflated, it is of no use. So it's good for us that when we don't need it, we still have to, to be prepared and to be ready for any emergency that may come. And how do we get ready? Number one is this, we have to live right. Live right before God. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, 12 to 14 says, it teaches us what? To say no to ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age. While we what? While we wait for the... Hello? Wait for the... What hope? Blessed hope. And what is the blessed hope? It explains the glorious appearing of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself up to redeem us from all wickedness and appearing for Himself people that are His very own, eager to do what is good. So what is it? We have to live right and say no to ungodliness, no to worldly passions, no to, you know, to wickedness, no to compromises. What is the price of your salvation? Obviously, it's been going around, you know. It says that, that how is it that the uh, MPs over in Sabah jumped to a different group and they have been offered, you know, 20, 30 million. So it, it's going around in social media. Sometimes people say that everyone has a price. If you push the price high enough, they will do anything for you. I pray that there will be no price for your faith. Because even though we would gain the whole world and lose our own soul, what good is that for us? There is no price. Never succumb to any compromise for you to dilute your faith, to, to you, for you to walk away from God, and for us to walk into sin, the temptation, the lure, the temporary pleasures. All these are the wicked schemes of the devil that we must be strong and what? We must say no to godliness. It is not wait, it is not let me see. But when it is ungodliness, that we are tempted to do something that is wrong, we so say no to ungodliness. See, there was a man who read a python and he put it in a glass box and with a lot of sawdust at the bottom. So one day he says that I'm going to give a treat to my python and he brought a, I bought a white mice. No, white mice are quite cute looking, uh, not the, the, the black ones, the white mice. And he threw the white mice inside that container that has the python. By that time, the python was asleep. And so the white mice thought to himself, how can I get out of this problem? I'm going to be sure a target for the python. So he had an idea. He saw all the sawdust that is there, and you know, with his two hind legs, he began to sweep the sawdust and to cover the python. The python didn't move at all. And it was managed, you know, scrape, 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 scrape. The, the, the entire python was covered with sawdust. And uh, the mouse felt he was a bit relieved. He says, now, you know, as long as I don't see the python, it's all covered, I am safe. Then the python woke up and shook itself out of the sawdust, saw the white, cute little mouse, and it says, I'm hungry, didn't know, lunchtime, and it ate up the mouse. The moral of the story is this. We can't hide the python of sin in our lives. We try to, can't hide, no, no sawdust to cover it, and that we will look out nice on the outside, thinking that we have everything under control, that no, we will be able to control this raging sin that is inside of us. As long as we don't see it, other people don't see it, it is going to be okay. No. But when a sin rises up, it's going to hurt our lives very, very badly. So never, 
Never compromise with sin in your life. Live right. Second thing is this, we have to serve now. Serve now. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 51, that tells us that we do not know when the time of Jesus is going to come. He comes out with this parable. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds himself doing what, when, so when he returns. I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. This refers to the second coming. Christ has given us a duty for us to be faithful. He's, he's a faithful servant of God. Be faithful to do what we have called. Because following those verses are an unfaithful servant. But he says, suppose that servant is wicked. The next style is like. Says to the master, my, son, my master is staying away a long time. He begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces, assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One who will not walk right with God, thinking that he's far away, he's not going to come back, and I'm in charge, I can do anything that I want to do with my life. And the master comes back suddenly. It's important for us to serve now. Let me ask you, if you know that Jesus Christ would come back 30 days from now, what would you do with your life? Wouldn't you be getting ready? Wouldn't you be saying, I want to live right and, and say, I want to get rid of all of my sins, you know, and, and not dabble in it any longer. I want to live right with God. I want to serve Him. And for the next 30 days, all that I can ever do, I will do it for the Lord. If you know that you have 30 days, Christ will come. Though we do not know the time when Christ comes, we've got to live in the shadows of He can come anytime. Let us be ready now. I remember the time that I was due, my first assignment to teach in a leadership uh, seminar in Maui. That's the island that is next to Hawaii. My first assignment as an international facilitator. The day before, I got everything ready. Packed my bags, you know, my jacket and all that I need. I'll be staying there for at least, you know, a week. So I had all the things ready, all my, you know, toothbrush, toothpaste, shaver, right, um, all that I need to do for the class and so forth, my notes, everything ready, my computer, and uh, I went to bed, hoping to fly the next day. When it was past 12 o'clock, it was about 1 or 2, my phone rang. And I woke up, I saw an unfamiliar figure. I said, you know, usually if someone rings me up, it would be a, 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 an emergency. I picked up the call, and he asked me, are, are you still Kinwai? Normally, when people ask you, are you still Kinwai, that people don't know me. Even. Have you received calls like this? Normally, it comes from you know, people from the bank and all that. Are you? And he gives us, you know, so and so. Yes, I am. And he says, you have just missed your flight. And uh, I was shocked and says, because, you know, I thought that the flight was on Monday, but because it was midnight, right, it was on Monday, but it says on two o one o'clock flight, so it, I missed that. I was asleep. And uh, quickly I made arrangements, say that is it possible for me to rebook uh, another flight? And he says, I will assist you and see what can be done. And, and she told me, you know, that uh, yes, there is uh, uh, a seat that is available on the next day. Would you want that? But this is the extra that you have to pay. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll pay the extra to, to fly. And so she booked it for me. And... Uh, after that, things were settled, I couldn't get back to sleep. <laughs> you know, when you, you get a sunny shadow, you missed, you, you, you missed your flight. I've never missed my flight before, okay? But you know how the 24-hour kind of thing is, especially if you see the date is Monday, but it's actually Sunday late, you know, and at midnight, it's very easy to, to, to mix up the time.
Now, if you miss the time of our coming, you won't be able to book another time. Do you know that? If Christ comes and we are totally unprepared, unaware, and we are not ready, we cannot say, can I rebook? <laughs> can you give me another date when you come back and I will, I will go back? There's no, no, no way that we can rebook our, you know, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing, which I'll close here right now, is this. We have to be eager for His coming. This I will tell you that, though even as I preach to you right now, the eagerness for the coming of Christ is something that I would have to work on. I believe in the second coming. But let me all be honest with you. There are certain things that I would still like to do. There are some places that I still have not traveled to. Okay? Um, when I see the things around, and yes, Christ is coming, but I also internally hope that wait a little bit longer, you know, let things settle, let the new normal come back to the old normal, let this business be, you know, the life continue on, and there are some things that I want to do this, some things I want to do that. Uh, wishfully, in my, in, inside of me, it says, wait a little while longer, right? Don't come back so fast. You, you come back, Lord, okay? But uh, I'm not so eager to immediately say, come back today, right now, and I'm all ready, I'm all smiling, and uh, I don't know about you. Huh? Probably some of you are ready. God, come tonight, because I don't want to pay my car mortgage, house, and all my bills. Get me out of this trouble. There'll be some people who want to get out of this as soon as they want to... <laughs> uh, they want to be free. Yeah. yeah. But Paul tells us this. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which, is the, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award on me on that day, not only to me alone, but to all who long for His appearing. I pray that we will long for His appearing. I've got that to work in my own heart. God, help me to long for Your appearing. That, uh, that the Word becomes so strong that I know that things are going to be even much, much better with you than anything else in the world. So yes, we do not know when is the time of Christ's coming. And really, we do not need to know the time. If we were to live right today, if we would serve now, if we would start preparing our hearts to long and love for His appearing. 